So this is going to be a short video to introduce you to the concept of sequences of functions. So let's begin with the motivation and the intuition for this. So we're very familiar then with sequences of real numbers where the terms in the sequence here are real numbers. And if we take an example, the sequence a n is equal to 1 over n, the intuition for what this is about is it's a sequence of points in the real line. So here's the first term, which is 1. Here's the second term, which is a half. Here's the third term, which is a third. Here's the fourth term, which is a quarter. And it goes on a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, an eighth. It goes on and on forever, this infinite sequence of points in this line. And of course, sequences are very interesting, especially when they have a limit, when there is a another point in the case of sequences of real numbers, when there is another point that they are getting closer and closer and closer to as you go on in the sequence. Now, when we move on to discussing sequences of functions, the terms in the sequence are not going to be real numbers. They're not going to be points in the real line anymore. They're going to be whole functions, which we can view as curves. So if we think of this example here, so the functions that are the terms in the sequence are all going to be over the same domain. We'll formalize this in a moment. So for our example, that we're going to pick the domain, the closed interval from 0 to 1, and these are the functions that we're taking. So fn is equal to 1 over 1 plus nx. So if you viewed the function f1, you'd put a 1 in here, and the function would be 1 over 1 plus x, and I've plotted this on here. So it's going to be a curve that looks something like this on the interval 0, 1. So if you put in 0, of course, you just get 1 over 1, so you, it'll be mapped onto 1. If you go to the other end of the domain, 1, if you put in 1 here, you'll get 1 over 1 plus, and remember, n is 1, so 1 times 1, so you'll get a half. So it's going down to a half, and it'll be some sort of hyperbola in between. So this is the function f1. Then if you go forward to f2, the second term in the sequence of functions, we now need a 2 here, so we'd get 1 over 1 plus 2x. And again, at x is equal to 0, this bit won't matter at all, so it'll still just be 1 over 1, so it'll be up at 1 here, at 0. But then as you go down to the other end of the domain, of course, in the middle it's going to be a hyperbola, but the other side now, we've got a 2 here, so put in 1 for x, and we'll get 1 over 1 plus 2, which is a third, so it's lower down. And then you can continue on f3, you're going to now have 3 there, and you can see that, again, at 0, no matter what your n is, however far you go in this function sequence, or, or sequence of functions, um, at 0, this bit is always going to be irrelevant, so the answer is always going to be 1, 0 is always going to be mapped onto 1. But um, at the other end of the sequence where you're putting in x is equal to 1, this bit will matter. And you can see that what 1 is going to be mapped onto is going to get smaller and smaller as n gets bigger and bigger. So we could continue plotting these on. So this is, if you like, f3. Um, and then we could go on f4, f5, f6. And we have this visual representation of what this sequence of functions represents. It represents this sequence of curves now. And we can ask, is there some sort of curve that it's getting closer and closer to as that sequence goes on and on. Now, the limit isn't going to just be a point as it was for a sequence of real numbers, but it's going to be an entire function itself, an entire curve. And I've just drawn a few more of these um, functions on here to hopefully give you the idea that as n is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, actually what this is going to get closer and closer to this sequence of curves. It's going to get closer and closer to the function that just maps everything onto zero apart from at one point, which is zero itself, where every single one of these functions is always going to map that onto one. So that's the sort of function that it's converging on. That's the limit, if you like, of this sequence of functions intuitively. So then, now we've seen an intuitive picture of what we're trying to start to study, um, let's go back to uh, defining it. So a sequence of functions is literally going to be the exact same sort of thing as I would write for a sequence of real numbers, except that now the terms in this sequence are not real numbers anymore, but they are functions. So here is f1, here is f2, here is f3, f4, f5, etc. Now all of these functions are going to be real valued functions for now, as we're studying real analysis. 
and it's important that they must be over the same domain. So if you've got a sequence of functions, all the functions in that sequence need to be over the same domain. So in our example, they were all over the domain 0, 1. That's important. You mustn't have one here that's suddenly over a totally different domain, like 5, 6, the interval from 5 to 6. That wouldn't work. They all do need to be over the same domain. And you can see how intuitively with this picture that makes sense. You know, if I had suddenly let's say f4, not being a function over this domain 0, 1, but being a function over some totally separate domain, that wouldn't make sense in terms of intuitively what we're trying to capture here. If you remember the more formal definition of a sequence of real numbers, you'll remember that formally, a sequence of real numbers is a function from the set of natural numbers into the real line. So you can view your sequence A as being a map from the natural numbers where we define the natural numbers as starting at 1 rather than 0, um, which is a controversial issue. Some people like to start it from 0, some people like to start it from 1. We'll take the definition of starting from 1 here. And you're mapping the natural numbers into the real numbers. And the way this literally works is each one of these represents the term in the sequence. So this is representing what the first term of the sequence is going to be. This is the second term, the third term, and then what it maps onto, that's the value that you're going to put in as your first term. So it'll map on, one will be mapped onto A1, that's saying A1 is the first term in the sequence. Two maps onto A2, that's saying A2, whatever that number is, is the second term of the sequence, etc. So this is formally what a sequence really means. It's this, capturing the same information as this intuitive notion of a sequence. It's saying each term of the sequence is ascribed this value. Formally, the way that that is done is a map. This captures the same information as this intuitive notion of a sequence. So if we want to take this formalism to this concept of sequences of functions, what we would do is if we call this sequence of functions S, then formally, the way that you encode the information here is that you would have S as a mapping, again, from the natural numbers beginning at one. Now, not into the real numbers, because the terms of the sequence are not real numbers now, but into some set of functions, which we will call a function space. And I've used this big, fancy, curly F here for this. So if you haven't seen this sort of an F before, big curly letters like this are often used in more advanced parts of analysis to represent sets of functions, which we call function spaces. So this is a nice one to use here for this. So big F is equal to the set of all real valued functions. So it's all functions F from some domain, which I've called D, that are real valued functions. So you can set this domain. In the case of this example, D would have been this interval from zero to one, but it could be a, a much more general domain of the real line. If we're talking about real valued functions of a real variable, then this domain will be some subset of the real line. But of course, this can be generalized in more advanced areas of analysis. So what this is meaning is it's going to be mapping each one of these natural numbers to an element of this set, which will be a function, a real valued function over that domain. And it will map one onto this function f1, two onto this function f2, three onto this function f3, four onto this function f4, etc. And it's just capturing that information of what function is what term in your sequence that is intuitively this picture here. So the final thing I'd like to introduce you to in this video is the concept of the limit of a sequence of functions, the concept of a convergent sequence of functions. And we're only going to scratch the surface of this. We're going to look at the very basics, which is the concept of it having a pointwise limit. There are more complicated, more useful, stronger notions of convergence that build on top of this. Um, but we'll do those later on. We're just going to look at the basics at the moment, which is the concept of pointwise convergence of a sequence of functions. And so if we have a sequence of functions, its limit is not going to be just a real number. Its limit is now going to be another function that's going to be defined over the same domain as all of the terms are. And this is how we're going to define its limit if it exists. So the limit as n approaches infinity of your sequence of functions is going to be the function that maps each point x in your domain onto its pointwise limit. 
of that sequence of functions. So each one of these functions here, you can put x into that function, because x is in the domain of all of them, and you can get out a real number, what x is mapped onto. That then means that your sequence of functions be can become a sequence of real numbers when you evaluate all these functions at some value x in your domain. You then want to ask, does that sequence of real numbers have a limit? And if it does, excellent, you're going to map your point x onto the limit of its respective sequence now of real numbers. And if those limits exist for every single one of the points in the domain, which we're looking at, then we say that the overall sequence of functions has a limit. And the limit is the function that maps each of the points in the domain onto um, the limit of its um, sequence of real numbers, which you get from evaluating all the functions at that point. So let's go to our example to illustrate this. So the example that I've drawn a picture of here, and I claim that this is what its limit is. And by the way, if someone just talks about the limit of a sequence of functions and doesn't clarify, um, you know, doesn't say pointwise limit or doesn't say any other type of limit, such as uniform limit, um, then you can assume that they mean pointwise limit. Pointwise is the most basic. All of the higher, stronger forms of convergence, they all imply pointwise convergence. They're just stronger versions of it. So if someone just says limit and doesn't tell you that it's one of these stronger versions, you should just assume that they mean that it's just the pointwise limit of your sequence of functions. So the pointwise limit or the limit of this sequence of functions is what I've written out here. It's the function that maps any point in the interval 0 to 1 onto these things given by these rules. So um, it maps x is equal to 0 onto the value 1 and for all the other points in the interval, so from 0 to 1, um, not including 0, they're all mapped onto 0. So my claim is that this is the limit of this sequence of functions and let me explain why. So look at what I've written down here. We need to map any x in our domain uh, onto what the limit of the sequence of real numbers is where you get this sequence of real numbers by evaluating your function at that point x. So here's our function. So what we now need to do is take an x and we now view x as being fixed and this then is now a sequence of real numbers. So we now need to go to each of the x's in our domain, plug it in here and look at that sequence of real numbers and see does it converge and if so, what does it converge to? So let's start with x is equal to zero. Well, when x is equal to zero, this bit completely goes. So we just get a constant sequence. We get the sequence one, 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 and that does converge, that converges to one. Therefore, x needs to be mapped onto that limit. So it needs to be mapped onto one. So that explains that. Now, let's also take the example of x is equal to 1 here. So when you put x is equal to 1, you get the sequence 1 over 1 plus n, and that sequence again converges as n approaches infinity. It's a sequence of real numbers. It converges and it converges to 0. So 1, therefore, is going to be mapped onto 0. And then if you think about all the ones in between, now so x is something properly in between 0 and 1. Now, x might be absolutely tiny, but it is a fixed number with respect to the sequence. So even if it's something like 0 0.00001, this n is growing indefinitely, go going to infinity. So even if you've got a tiny number here, that's a tiny fixed number with respect to the sequence. So whatever it is, this n at some point is going to dominate over it. And therefore, this denominator is just going to get indefinitely big. And therefore, this sequence is still going to go to zero. So whatever x you actually pick that's properly in between zero and one, this sequence of real numbers is still eventually going to go to zero. So this limit does exist and is equal to zero. So all of these x's that are properly in between zero and one are being mapped onto zero. So that explains why x is an element of 0 to 1, not including 0, they're all mapped onto 0. So this is the limit of our sequence of functions. And you can see why it's called a pointwise limit, because we are looking at each one of the points in the domain, and then we're looking at what the sequence of functions evaluated at that point is going to. Uh, so we're really just we're not kind of evaluating the the function over the entire domain. We're just 
or we're not thinking about the function over the entire domain. We just go to each of the individual points in the domain and ask for that point, does the sequence of functions evaluated at that point converge to something? So it's kind of not a very holistic notion of convergence. You're splitting the function down for each of the points in the domain and looking at convergence at each of the points rather than looking at a more global concept. And you can see that the result here isn't necessarily that nice. So we have a sequence of functions here that are continuous everywhere over the domain. And yet they're converging to a limit that is discontinuous. Discontinuous at the point x is equal to zero has this huge jump. That doesn't feel nice particularly. And as I say, there is this stronger notion of convergence for a sequence of functions known as uniform convergence, which requires more than what I've insisted here in order for you to say that uh, a function is the uniform limit of a sequence of functions. And indeed, this example doesn't obey uniform convergence. This might be the pointwise limit of this sequence of functions, but it doesn't obey the stronger criteria. It is not the uniform limit of this sequence of functions. We'll come on to uniform convergence in subsequent videos. There is no uniform limit for this sequence of functions over this domain, uh, by the way. Uh, there is only a pointwise limit which is here, it doesn't obey the strong criteria to have a uniform limit. So we'll finish there. I hope that that's introduced you to the concept of a sequence of functions and the limit of a sequence of functions.